Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Arts and Mom podcast. I'm Lauren Rose, and today's guest is Brandy Shantz. Brandy lives with Crohn's disease, fibromyalgia, medication-induced lupus, and a neurological disorder from the medicine Humira. She's also the host of the Living Chronic podcast. Thank you for coming on, Brandy. Thank you for having me. So tell us about your life with chronic pain and illness. Well, um, like many people who have a, a chronic condition, it did take a long time for me to be actually diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So I was not diagnosed with the disease until 2013. So I've been living with the diagnosed disease for 10 years now. Unfortunately, it was very difficult in the beginning. We tried many different medications that just were not working at all. And it took me a few years before we settled on something that at least was, it, you know, got me to at least living my life a little bit. I was still not, you know, doing great, but I was living my life. 2017, I had a very difficult year. I spent a good portion of that year in and out of the hospitals and just did not have any ability to do anything that I once had done because the Crohn's was so bad. And that's when a doctor put me on Humira and started me on that once every week is when I took the Humira. It's an injection. So it stays in your body for that week. And then you take your next dose. And it did get me back on track and doing some things. I was out uh, running again, doing all the active things that I love to do. And then early 2020 is when I just suddenly lost my ability to exercise and I couldn't understand why. Unfortunately, that was the same time period. Of course, the entire world locked down and being immunocompromised, I was told basically, unless I'm dying, stay at home. So I didn't get any doctor's visits for quite some time, but even once I did finally get to doctors, it took me a full 19 months before I did get a diagnosis of drug-induced lupus and neurologic disorder. Um, it was a very difficult year to say the least, traumatic experience. And, you know, I just suffered a lot of various symptoms that I now know are actually quite common when you take a, a, that particular kind of biologic drug induced lupus is not nearly as rare as one may believe. I have met so many people who've gone through the exact same experience. Um, probably the hardest part was just losing my ability to walk. It's very scary. You don't expect to lose your ability to walk. And it really frightened me, you know, to be honest. And frankly, it was just difficult to get back up again. You lose 19 months of your life. It's it's difficult to stand up again and get moving. And unfortunately, even once I discontinued the Humira, it just didn't go away. So sure, it wasn't as bad. I did get my ability to walk back within, I think, two, three weeks after I, uh, after my last Humira dose. So I skipped a dose and then, you know, pretty quickly, a week or two later, I was walking again and slowly starting to get my ability to move back. But unfortunately, along with all of that came pain. And that's really where my journey that I'm going through today begins, because I'm still learning how to deal with the pain that I live with every single day. Some days are better than others, but it's here with me. And, you know, I've been processing through a lot. I know many of us, you go through something like this, you're angry, um, depressed, but I try to look as every, at every day as a new day and a journey and trying to learn how to better deal with my pain, live the life that I really want to live. And of course, get through a lot of the emotion that comes along with just living with a chronic illness. Actually, you know, throughout this time, um, doctors diagnosed me with fibromyalgia as well. It's a presumed condition from when I served near the burn pits in uh, the army so I, I'm dealing with the Crohn's pain. I deal with fibromyalgia. Um, I'm dealing with still with just getting through all of the pain and, that I went through with the drug and lupus. Fortunately, I've gotten my balance back. That's, that's a great thing. But every day is a different day. And some days are better than others. Some days I really feel motivated, like I can really keep going. And then other days I struggle. 
Yeah, that's t pretty typical of people with, with chronic pain. There are all those emotions. I know mostly I was depressed. And when I was angry, I was angry at my own body. I felt like my body had betrayed me. You know, I was just in my mid thirties when the just full body pain started, the arthritis all over me. And I was really, I was wearing a back brace to walk and it was incredibly painful. And I was just so angry at my own body. You know, I wasn't angry at the world. I wasn't, I was just angry at myself and my body and, and very depressed for a couple of years. I was really grieving, right? Just grieving everything that I'd lost, including my functionality. I mean, not just my job and my career, but my ability to do things like I'd done them before. That was really tough. And, you know, that's, I think you, the way you did it was so smart in hindsight. Of course, everything looks great in hindsight. When I was diagnosed with the Crohn's at that time, I just could not do the job I had been doing. I had this career that required, it required me to work in office. Even today with all of the work from home, if I were still in that career field, you just can't do that work from home. Everything I did was classified. Top secret. If it's top secret document, it has to be in a skiff. You cannot, you know, do work from home. Uh, and I just pretended everything was okay. I was like, don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry about me. I, you know, found a way to work instead. I started a business that allowed me to be very flexible with my time. So I've worked from home. I've worked from the hospital. I've worked from the infusion center. You name it, I've worked there. And it it enabled me to keep working, but really what I did was I just kept pushing through, you know, just telling everybody, don't worry, I'm fine, I'm fine, everything's still the same, I've got everything under control, and I never ever grieved the loss of my former self or my career. It wasn't until the drug-induced lupus happened that, you know, sort of everything really kind of came crashing down, and I was forced to deal with the reality of my circumstances and really and truly look inward and be introspective about where I am, where I came from and where I want to be in the next 10 years. Yeah, I didn't realize at the time that I was grieving. I realize that now. I, if I'd realized that at the time, I would have done more to actually honor that grieving process. I would have journaled more. I would have, you know, cried more. I would have tried to feel the grief. Instead, I really was really just feeling the, the depression because I didn't realize that's what I was doing at the time. But I'm glad I do now because that was an important process. And maybe if I'd realized I was grieving, it wouldn't have taken two years. Maybe mm -hmm. it would have. Maybe, maybe it would have. I have no idea. It's a process. I tell you what, I, you, I like to resolve things. You know, that's, that's my personality. Is there a problem? <laughs> Let me solve it. Very much, you know, vanilla ice over here. There's a problem. I'll solve it. And I can't solve this problem. You know, I, I keep trying to use, a th you know, one therapist or one antidepressant or, oh, look, let me take control of my life and do this. Let me join this board. And, you know, it's just not a problem you can quickly solve. And I've learned the hard way that it does take years to work through this. And I'm probably going to be working through my pain and my emotions every single day for the rest of my life because you know, it is, it's, it's, you know, I don't think, I don't think anybody talks about this, but nobody wakes up excited that they have a disability. You know, you just right. don't wake up in the morning and say, I've accepted it. Everything's fine. As much as I wanted to believe that I think every day is a different day. And probably for the rest of my life, there's going to be days where I think, well, I can't believe that this is where I'm at. And I have a disability because there's times there's just nothing I can do about it. You know, maybe I'm having a flare and I had planned on going to the beach with friends or something like that. And now, you know, that's just not something I can do, or I maybe I have to miss a very important dinner with my husband or something like that. I just think, you know, it's something that we have to deal with every single day. And maybe I'll be grieving for the rest of my life in various ways. I agree. I think this is the hardest part of having chronic pain and illness is just the unpredictability of it all. And even deeper than the unpredictability is the lack of control. Like mm -hmm. We have no control over whether or not we're going to wake up in a flare or having a medium pain day or having pain day. We have no knowledge, no control. 
And that is so hard. It really is. It, it, it really is. It's hard to make a plan. It's hard to, you know, just, just knowing what your day is going to feel like. I didn't realize how great that was. I, I never, I took com- for complete granted health, you know, and you, you just don't think about it. But once you do lose your good health, you think, wow, I really didn't think about how great that was. As a matter of fact, when I, you know, I was forced obviously to go on a new medication after the reaction to Humira and we decided to start me on Stellara and you know what, years and years of pain and struggle and going through different meds and my goodness, I'm in remission. I'm in symptom free remission. And it was so surreal to me to wake up in the morning, the first morning and not have issues with my gut. It, it was, I just couldn't even understand what happened to me. I was like, wow, did life used to be this way? Did I just wake up in the morning and go about my life? I completely forgot what it felt like. And that's when I realized that I really just took for granted my health before because I never realized how good it feels to wake up in the morning and just go about your life. Right. And yes. I think it was yesterday. No, it was Wednesday. I woke up and I wasn't feeling too bad. And then all of a sudden, just right after I'd eaten lunch, my pain just started coming just all of a sudden, just pretty quickly. And I had to spend the rest of the day in bed. So even if you wake up feeling okay, that doesn't mean the rest of the day. No, you're right. And it's just, it's just, it just sucks. It, It really does. You know, um, it's, it's, I think it's happened to all of us so many times. You think you're having a great day or really positive, And then just like that, things start going downhill. You don't feel well and you have to spend that rest of the day in bed. Um, it just happened to me not long ago. I think two weeks ago, I ended up missing. I joined the Crohn's Colitis Foundation board in the DC metro area. And I had to miss the board meeting because I was fine all day long. And then all of a sudden I just couldn't move. I just couldn't move. And my day was over at five that day, you know, nothing more for me. So, you know, I had to just let them know I'm just too sick to go on today. I don't know why I woke up the very next day feeling fine, but, you know, I've just learned to take it as it comes. Some days I might be good all day. Some days I might only be good a portion of the day. Some days I may not be able to get out of bed. Right. Have you found any that that helps your your physical pain the fibromyalgia and the other types of pain that you have any modalities you know I I do um exercise I think it's very important to move your body everything that I've read everything I've learned moving your body even if you you know it's painful can be very helpful to to getting you moving again and feeling better so you know I do a lot of yoga um I just you know I don't have that capability to do you know, the big Ironman competitions like I used to like to do, but I do a lot of yoga. Um, I, you know, I do some light running. I don't do the big runs anymore. Um, But, you know, yoga helps a lot. Meditation helps a lot. And trying to keep my diet on track helps a lot. Uh, I don't eat any processed sugars. I, you know, make everything, you know, from scratch in my house, you know, Sundays are, you know, often my day to just make the most ridiculously giant batch of fresh marinara sauce or, you know, some other sauce or whatever it is I want to, to uh, eat with dinners and lunches or whatever through the re- the week, because believe it or not, it's, it's something that you read about and you think, oh, that can't be real. I mean, you stop buying the canned goods, the, the processed foods, but it really has helped a lot. Um, you know, it doesn't make everything perfect. Of course, I'm still the same person with the same diseases, but eating right and taking out that sugar really, really does reduce the inflammation quite a bit. So it at least enables me to feel somewhat better. Yeah, I have come down on my sugar a lot, you know, compared to how much I used to eat. I used to love candy, but, um, I'm I'm definitely not perfect at that because just the, you know, I can barely might make my family dinner, you know, a few nights a week. 
So the thought of making everything myself is really overwhelming. I have no idea how you manage that. Lots of pre-planning and, you know, um, I, I've come a long way since I've, you know, been, I've been off the Humira now for a year and a half. Um, I think it was September 27th, 2021 was my last dose. So I've had a lot of time to recover. I've worked really hard to get a lot of my strength back, my balance back. That took a lot of work. It was, I, I felt like a full-time job just trying to every day do what I can, get in the work, go through physical therapy, get that, that balance back was probably the hardest, but you know, the, the light exercise, the yoga, it really has helped me quite a bit. Um, I also, I do a lot of therapy. I take um, antidepressants, which, which has helped. I remember being pretty moody about that when it was first suggested. I, I knew that I had, you know, a lot of problems with depression after everything I'd gone through. And I felt that was fair. I mean, I, it was a pretty traumatic event. But, um, you know, when everybody kept trying to relate my fibromyalgia to my trauma and PTSD from the army and my depression, and I just thought, you people must be crazy. That is not what the problem is at all. But, um, you know, the more I focus on my mental health, uh, the, the, the better I've gotten. I still deal with daily pain, but I'm able to manage it in a way that I can do the things that I want to do. Yeah, that's my goal. I don't expect to ever have low pain all the time or be pain free. I'm just trying to find ways to to manage it better. And on days when my mental health is pretty good, I find it a lot easier to manage the the physical pain. But if I wake up and for whatever reason I'm just having a really rough day whether I'm depressed or whether my whether my anxiety is out of control, pain is just so much harder to manage. It, it really is. I, as my, you know, my mental health is my biggest struggle. It, it really is. I do very well with the exercise and focusing on the exercise because I've been an athlete my whole life. So it's something I know how to focus on. I know how to do better. I've been a run coach for years. I still keep my personal trainer license up to date. I know that when it comes to an activity, I can really focus in on what I need to do, set a goal, and I'm very focused. You know, I don't quit, um, but it's the other things. You know, it's been me trying to kind of reclaim my life in the other ways. Um, I decided to um, go back into a career field that's just more rewarding for me and fulfilling. Um, you know, I started a real estate business. I never enjoyed it. It was just something that paid the bills. And with everything I've gone through, I've been, you know, working on looking for something new in life. And, and that has its own mental health challenges. And, and uh, I, I can tell how it drags me down. I still, you know, there's better days now. I'm not nearly as angry as I once was, but I'm still pretty angry at doctors. And, uh, you know, I've been failed <laughs> in a pretty spectacular way by doctors. And it, you know, it, it really brings down my mental health. I can feel myself in my body responding to how I am responding to a doctor that I'm dealing with now, maybe somebody in the past. Uh, you know, you want to try to make a positive impact and, you know, turn things around and make lemonade out of lemons and all those great things. But you know, some days I'm good at it and other days I'm just really angry. I'm just really angry. It happened to me. I'm really angry that, you know, the FDA, you know, still doesn't respond. I'm angry that my congressman gets like 700 letters from me a day and phone calls, it feels like, and has not once even, you know, responded or addressed anything to do with um, the issues at the FDA. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I had to go through a group I belong to and uh, met somebody at Amazon who works with machine learning and, and government. I'm <laughs> trying to work through that avenue. Like, hey, Amazon, I know you guys can do something about this FDA uh, adverse reaction database. Let, let's uh, let's work together. Um, so yeah, I just still, it's, it's difficult. I think the mental health aspect of all of this is the most difficult. Yeah, I, I completely agree. The physical pain can be excruciating, but 
when the mental health isn't great, it's just all so much worse. It, it really is. I, I've learned so much the hard way since this happened. Um, you know, and I've, I think the most important thing I've learned, and I convey this to every friend and family member and other patients, you know, it's really important to remember you can't rank your suffering, you know, so often. And I never thought about it before I myself ended up with what I have. But so often you hear, you know, when you're going through something, somebody will say, well, at least you're feeling, you know, you didn't lose a leg while you were in Afghanistan, or at least you're not dying, or at least you're not this, or, you know, and I've learned you can't rank. There is no, at least I don't have, I, I'm suffering every day for the rest of my life. So sometimes I'm just going to wallow in that. Thank you. Um, <laughs> And of course, that's not healthy either, but I think it's important to acknowledge that, you know, there's no ranking system here, you know, oh, you're suffering in pain every day, but at least you're able to work. Well, you know, that that's not a ranking system. It's, it's, you know, we're dealing with pain every day and that should be acknowledged. It, it shouldn't be diminished because we have a perceived pain, you know, that's less than somebody else's. Right. And I know that's hard to do, not compare ourselves to other people. And it's hard for people not to compare us to other people that they know. But I think that's a really good point. Yeah. So can you talk about this, this database, this adverse? Yes. Because I know you've had some major reactions. I've had some bad reactions. Um, I had, I had one time where luckily it was just temporary, but I couldn't walk from Remicade, a biologic that I was getting in, infusions of, um, and then I've had some hallucinations when I mixed two medications my doctor gave me. And so that was really bad. So please talk about this. So the adverse reaction database, um, you know, it's it should be something that is very robust, well-focused and well-run. Um, it's actually, first and foremost, I have to say, it is run by scientists. You can tell it's run by scientists. I love scientists. I just want them to do science things when it comes to running a business doing strategic communications, I'd like a professional in that field. And you can see where things go wrong pretty quickly if you take a look into the database. Um, first, nobody's required to report adverse reactions other than the drug companies themselves by law. Now, it is impossible to require patients their of course, but Doctors should also be required to report these reactions. The next problem with the database is it is a very antiquated system. It's a fill in the blank kind of a system. So very similar patent mirror or similarly class drugs, losing that ability to walk. We had similar reactions. Many people have had that reaction, but because it's fill in the blank, we all may, might say it differently. I might have said I had muscle myalgia. Somebody else might say, well, my body just went stiff. Somebody else might say my muscles were very tight. Um, somebody else may just call it joint pain because they just don't know what else to say. And nobody codifies this. Nobody looks for similar patterns. It's just all thrown into this database. It's fat fingered in just like it would have been in you know, 1986. There has, there's been nothing done to update this database. So if you go to look at the database, it's impossible to really see the frequency of something happening because it's not grouped together. I don't have time to read through all of the things in that database. There's thousands. And but so you want to be able to group them, but you can't because they're all described in different ways. And there's there's no classification, there's there's no way to group them or um, codify this, give it any uniformity, anything at all. The next thing that makes it worse is while the FDA does basically meet the requirement, they technically meet the requirements they should by releasing these reports. They do a quarterly report. Good luck opening the file. It's a text file. It's huge. Um, it was, I mean, text file. Yeah, exactly. So, and you have all these doctors who are busy. We, we've, I mean, if you don't know that doctors are understaffed and overworked at this point, you really haven't even turned on the news since, you know, March, 2020. They don't have time to read, you know, 
I don't even know. I can't tell you how long it took me to figure out how to open that text file. <laughs> and I'm pretty tech savvy. I had my husband in, we were using different computers. We went in to use this big giant gaming computer with all the computing power just to try to, doctors don't have time for that. And then even if they do open this file, there's no way to really read it and gather anything from it. It's just raw data. It's not aggregated correctly and there's no analysis. So if you're a busy doctor who always prescribes Humira or Imbril or something of that nature, you just want to be able to look and see if there's any trends. So that would be easily done with machine learning. Of course, it's 2023. We can maybe move up from the text file to machine learning where that machine can figure out when I say, oh, I was on a biologic and I suffered from severe muscular myalgia. And then you go in and say, oh, I was on a biologic and I just suddenly lost my ability to walk. My muscles were stiff. And then somebody else comes in and says, oh, you know, I was on this biologic and then all of a sudden I just had really tight muscles and joint pain. You know, machine learning would be able to figure out that those are all the same thing. And then they would be able to group them together and give it some uniformity. So you can easily see, oh, there's three people who suffered this exact same reaction all within the same week. And then you can push that down to doctors and say, we have an increase of 46% of patients who are now experiencing this type of reaction from this type of drug. And that could be very easily done. We have the technology to do it today, but unfortunately it just isn't done. So that is exactly why I went 19 months without being diagnosed with my condition. And it shouldn't have gone that way. Uh, that's my, I finally switched doctors for my PCP, somebody I really like. And he, even he said, but yeah, but you know, that reaction is extremely rare. And I said, no, it's really not. I said, I'm nobody. I'm nobody. I started a podcast, try to work through my emotions and hopefully help some other people who are going through some similar things. And you know what? I continually meet people who had that exact same thing happen over and over and over. Heck, I've ran into them on the streets, my neighbors. Oh yeah, my brother had that happen. Oh, you know, my mom had that happen, my cousin. So, you know, while my experiences are not statistically significant, it is very significant to note that somebody who is not in the medical field, somebody who is not an influencer, somebody who does not have these big followings has been able to easily bring together this many people who are all having the exact same reaction to a drug. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And until, you know, I, I talked to you, I've always just called it severe knee pain and my husband carry me from one room to the other. Mm -hmm. But when you talked about loss of walking, I'm like, well, that's exactly what I had. It was more than just joint joint pain. So that I literally couldn't walk. My husband was carrying me. Yeah. And that and, was what was difficult. I mean, we're patients, yeah. right? We're not doctors. Uh, now some patients are doctors, but how was I, I don't, I don't know. It was so difficult for me to explain, especially since when I started going through this reaction, I had been training fireman Chattanooga. So I was just saying, oh, inability to exercise all of a sudden. And then as things kept getting worse, I was like, well, you know, I have joint stiffness all of a sudden. Well, wait a minute. My muscles are really tight. I just have really tight muscles. And then I was doing my own research. I said, that's called muscle myalgia. So then I'd say, I have muscle myalgia. And then I'd still get kind of a blank look. Like, well, we don't really know what you're experiencing right now. Um you know, it's hard for us to explain, but a doctor should be able to know exactly what these reactions could be and, you know, bring that vague description we're giving and, you know, relate it to the drug that they have prescribed. Any doctor who prescribes a drug should be able to accurately identify all potential reactions with that drug. No, I completely agree. It is a problem just people in government not caring too much red tape what, what are you seeing you know the best I've been able to come to so far is there just doesn't seem to be a lot of funding for it right now um you know I, I keep trying to get congress involved you know it's one thing to technically meet the standard it's another thing to do the right thing for patients and while the FDA is technically meeting the standard, they're not doing the right thing for patients. And I'd like to see that database made in a way so that doctors can easily just get a report every quarter and say, you know, it looks like 
drug-induced lupus is actually pretty common with Humira. Let's see, what are the side, what, what do these um, symptoms look like? Oh, muscle myalgia. Okay, you know, loss of ability to exercise. You know, these are all things that could be easily looked over in a quarterly report sent to doctors who prescribe a drug. You know, read through it, read through it, read through it. Got it. And you know, it's something that's so simple, but that just hasn't been addressed. I was, I made the joke when I you know, FOIA'd everything from the FDA and was looking through the adverse reaction database and trying to figure out what, you know, what went wrong. And I made the joke, oh, this thing must be run by scientists. And <laughs> when I met uh, the person at Amazon who does the machine learning, who does have a relationship with the FDA, she said, no, yes, Brandy, that's exactly who's in charge of that database. Okay. And, you know, which blows my mind, you know, it's like putting a, uh, a painter in charge of an engineering division. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Right. Aren't you working with Congress on something else too? Well, I'm, I'm always trying to get things done. Uh, the <laughs> Steps Act is in front of the Senate now and yeah. it's part of a larger bill, but take steps. Um, it is a bill that would allow patients to get the drugs that they need that their doctor has assessed are the best drugs for them currently. And I, you know, found this out the hard way myself. Many people have found this out. If a doctor prescribes you, I mean, actually Humira is a good example and says they think that's the best drug for you, a drug company and, you know, just some person in the drug company doesn't have to be an actual GI doctor or anything like that take a look at it and say, no, no, I think you need to try prednisone first. And then they'll keep trying to revert you back to cheaper drugs and take those steps until you get to the next drug. But often doctors can know, you know, if you need to do that or just go on this other drug. And the point I keep making and try, you know, I put this in every email, every, say it in every phone call, every time I talk to uh, anybody about this, whether it be, you know, one of my congressmen or, um, you know, just a patient. I need to be able to live my life. It's not okay to let a patient sit there and suffer and not be able to go to work, not be able to join friends to do something, not be able to mom their own kids, to not be able to, you know, just, just live life um, because you want to see if they can first be treated with something cheaper. You know, that that's that's not OK. And there is even an economic argument to be made. You know, how much are you losing in the economy with all of these patients and autoimmune diseases are on the rise? So are chronic conditions. How much productivity are we losing when we have drug companies that are requiring these patients to sit on disability, short term disability sometimes or, you know, just not be able to work, just sit at home? or, you know, not be able to, you know, do these things that are necessary to keep the world running, to keep our lives running. You know, how much productivity are we really losing just because one drug company or one insurance company, I should say, my apologies, one insurance company wants to see if they can save a few dollars. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Take Steps Act is very important because it's really necessary in, uh, for patients to be able to get the right drugs that they need. I think that's amazing. I mean, I've had doctors want me to take certain medications or get certain procedures or surgery and my insurance comes back and says no you have to go back and get another x-ray or you have to try this medication instead or or they just flat out deny it for just any reason that they possibly can and it's just you know i remember the first time i i didn't realize this happened um, I was on TRICARE, which is military insurance for years. And I, you know, went to Walter Reed and, um, they got me onto the Humira, which was the first thing that got me actually living again. And, um, that was my first traumatic experience, you know, losing my life in its entirety for a year because my Crohn's was so, so bad. So I did not want to go backwards. Um, I had switched off of TRICARE to Johns Hopkins military family plans. I thought, Johns Hopkins, that sounds better. But what I didn't know is Johns Hopkins is a private insurance company versus TRICARE, which is government 
healthcare. Well, government healthcare, when the doctor says give her Humira, the government just says, okay, send her in, we'll hand her a shot. Um, private said, mm, let's go back and try prednisone again. Um, <laughs> I had, you know, obviously I had a breakdown. I had just finally gotten out of my house for the first time. I was not going backwards. I was not going through that trauma again. And I was, I was very lucky because I called Humana Military. And even though I was outside of the window to switch back to TRICARE, she found a loophole and got me back into the government system. So I was so thankful for it because my doctor had, I mean, she, she went above and beyond. That was the only thing that I missed about that Johns Hopkins plan. I had the best primary care doctor you can imagine. She was calling everybody trying to get this exception through, trying to tell them, look, she needs this medication. And um, she just wasn't succeeding. They just weren't hearing her. She, I, and I thought I could buy it myself too. And that is the next point, you know, the next thing I really want to work on with um, Congress and try to advocate for, we need cheaper drugs. Uh, I thought to myself, you know what? I've been fortunate in life in many ways. I'll pay for this month's supply of Humira at, the Walgreens, and then we'll keep trying to get the insurance company to cover it. And that's when I went up to Walgreens and she goes back, gets my Humira, brings it up. And she says, well, that'll be $10,000. Yeah. $10,000. <laughs> what? No. So I called the doctor. I was like, uh, this is $10,000 a month. Nobody told me that. And she was uh, able to get me in with a charity and, you know, and I got my Humira through charity until the uh, Humana military uh, representative was able to backdoor me back into the system. So, I mean, these, these things are very important for patients when, when you're going through this and you're just trying your best to get back to your life. The last thing we need is an insurance company saying, you know what, I know the doctor thinks that this is what you need to get back to life, but why don't we give it another six months to a year of trying some other cheaper stuff before we let you go about life. It's just not okay. Right. Yeah. My insurance company will let me have Botox for my migraine prevention, but not a secondary injection for prevention. They're like, you have to pick one. Oh gosh. Like, well, I can, I can get down to one to two a month if I have both, but okay. You know, if you're only going to let me have one, you know, I, I picked the Botox, but it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. And I'm on one medication for my mental health that it's, it's an addition to my antidepressant and it's four grand a month. Mm -hmm. But luckily, luckily I've got this, you know, manufacturer's coupon at the moment, which is good for 12 months. I don't know what's going to happen after 12 months of being honest. That's, that's you know? the problem. I mean, I would have never thought about these things until I myself got sick. It's like four grand, four grand a month. <laughs> What do you think we're doing here in the United States? Yeah. I mean, my goodness, you could be very successful and still that's a little ridiculous. Um, yeah. It's a little ridiculous, you know. <laughs> no, Nobody deserves to go through this at all. Um, yeah, it's frustrating. And you, you know, looking for manufacturers coupons, searching for local charities. Mm -hmm. um, something has to be done about drug prices. Something. I've heard of right. people going completely broke just because they got sick. Yeah. Every day for my government insurance. Yeah, my sister-in-law has got a rare form of cancer and Medicare won't pay for her chemo. So, I mean, that's tens of thousands of dollars. And trust me, they live in a travel trailer. They don't have tens of thousands of dollars, you know, just laying around. But they're trying to, to keep her alive, you know. It's just, it's really, really sad. It really is. I know there's a lot of people out there working hard. One of my uh, running buddies, she works for Deloitte. She does some really great work with them consulting. She's a scientist herself. And her entire existence right now is trying to relabel drugs specifically so that cancer patients who need them can actually get them and get them paid for by insurance. Because many of the necessary drugs that you need for gosh, so many illnesses, not just cancer, others, they're not on label. It's an off label, you know, not every off label yeah. use of drug is something super sexy, like Ozempic and trying to lose weight. Um, sometimes those off labels are very important for your life. So you can live, 
And that's the one she specifically is working on trying to get these labels changed for cancer, drugs that can help cancer patients so their insurance will actually pay for it. So I know there's a lot of great people out there just putting in the hard work to try to help us, but it really needs to be more because it's, uh, it's very difficult when you live each and every day of your life in pain, potentially dying, um, going through, you know, the, the most unimaginable things in your life, and you just can't get an insurance company to cover it. Yeah, it's, it's beyond unfair. It's just not right. It's, it is. it's wrong. It's inhumane. I, I, that's that's the right word. I've probably said that word a million times to various <laughs> services, <laughs> administrators. It's inhumane. It is. So you host a podcast called Living Chronic. Tell us about that. So I started Living Chronic as a first, just as a way to kind of process through my emotions after everything I'd gone through, but also to try to help somebody else. Um, you know, it's so helpful when we get to talk to each other and you and I just were, oh yeah, I had that reaction. I had that reaction too. And when you're out here and you're talking about that, other people can recognize it themselves. So that maybe somebody listening to my podcast, maybe if they're on a, a biologic in the same class as Humira or on Humira itself, and they suddenly start losing their ability to exercise or walk, they'll understand, I remember Brandy saying something about this. And, and then of course, there's just so much that, you know, we didn't know any of us when we were first diagnosed and we've learned over years. So I think it's helpful to share that information and continue to share that information. I've learned so much. I learned so much from you about reframing how I think about my pain. And I've been trying to really focus on that. And it's, you know, it is helpful when you can try to use your mind to reframe how you're thinking about this pain that you're experiencing. So, um, you know, living chronic, is just about, you know, living life every day with a chronic disease. I talk to a lot of really great people who have also been living with chronic illness, many who are just helping others, psychiatrists, psychologists, nutritionists, um, chiropractors. So uh, hopefully it's a, it's a very helpful podcast for anybody living with a chronic illness and hopefully it at least reaches some people. Yeah. So where can we get more information about your podcast and about you? So my website is livingchronic911.com. So you can go to my website and link there to my podcast, which is on all platforms. I also have a blog on my website. I publish my blog articles, both on my website and on Substack under Brandy Schantz. That's the German's name with an S-C-H. And, um, you know, hopefully I can just share with some people some of my experiences and, um, you know, help somebody else out. Yep, that's my goal too. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, make sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any health parenting or life advice. For my freebie, 30 Ways to Relieve Pain Without Taking a Pill, go to ithurtstomom.com slash tips. If you want to contact me, email me at ithurtstomom at gmail.com. I wish everybody a blessed and pain-free day. Bye.